Hello, my name is Ian Forrest, back now with my video 13. It is the beginning of November 2015 and quite a lot has happened since my last one, both in my world and beyond. This is a very important one and I hope that you will see it through to the end because it has great importance and significance for us all and that includes you. But who am I? For all those switching on as it were. Well, I am the victim of serial theft and criminality, imprisoned and tortured to silence my truthful reporting of corruption and for a false and crooked confession. I'm also a whistleblower. You know that breed of person which people in authority and offenders want to exterminate. But we play an essential role in helping others who suffer from injustice and often very much more. So this video concentrates very much upon your interests, not just you in the UK, but across the world. As I can now explain more clearly the results and lessons from my experience of 26 years. <clears throat> Thus, in this one, I'm going to identify five essential features of our personal lives, be they related to those in so-called civilized societies and others. In brief, the categories are personal values and aspiration, freedom and freedom of expression, human rights, corruption and equality. Of course, they are all interlinked. You will know that for most of us, life is a struggle. The outside world is bad enough, but personal formation is the essential part of what we become. Circumstances change for us, but within we build up and cling to our values and hopes. These include a sense of fairness, honesty, integrity, kindness, and so on. To help us on our journey through life, we rely upon others to show perhaps a higher grade of those personal qualities, especially where society has endowed them with special privilege and responsibility. I will return to this later. Despite frantic attempts lately in the UK to restrict us, we know that freedom of expression is essential to our lives. Without it, around the corner will come lack of freedom itself. I should know from my wicked imprisonment. Oh yes, in the UK. It was our Winston Churchill, no less, who set in train after the last war, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which led to the creation of the European Convention on Human Rights. Other countries followed or had the equivalent. Those rights and civil liberties are essential to our lives, not least as protection against abuse by those in power, oppression, and corruption. Which leads me on to the next category, corruption. It can take many forms. The leader must surely involve money, overtly or covertly. Important spin-offs produce favoritism, maintenance of power, oppression and repression, self-protection and suppression of that freedom of expression. To fight those evils, we have in place those human rights and liberties, which should bring a large status of equality to victims and the means to achieve justice. Ah, that word I have used so many times over so many years, justice. Enwrapped within its notional description are the ideals of fairness, honesty, integrity and fair outcome. The path leading to those in the UK brings us to the doors of the judicial system, the practitioners and administrators of the rule of law in the courts. Their main objective should be to deal with presented offenders. After the controllers of the rule of law in the field, the police and CPS have undertaken their duties diligently and fairly. But in practice, as most people know, who have had occasion to seek justice, those organisations very often work in complete opposition to the standards and responsibilities to which they should aspire. Unlike me, nearly everyone in, in a legal dispute uses a solicitor and or barrister to pursue their purpose at vast expense. Either way, there is a quick realisation that there are not only black holes of twisted outcome, but that, that the judicial players form tears of self-interest and secrecy interlaced with greed and hidden agendas. For instance, 
As has been often questioned by the media press over the years, why is it that the banks and financial institutions are always protected by the judiciary and no officer has been imprisoned for the widespread criminality which is committed within their ranks? When I came back to the UK more than 25 years ago, I had been robbed of over £1 million by crooked and cheating banks, protected by the colluding judiciary. To be repeated again many years later. For all that time, I have struggled to get restitution and justice against the judicial system. But I have simply been wasting my time. Why should they change when they are doing very nicely against the interests of most of us? So lately, during last May, to be precise, I have put in a financial claim of £200 million and requirement for the judicial regime to change. And that's been put into the UK Parliament. How will I get on? Well, you see, my future holds difficulties for me. Long ago, I realised that solicitors, barristers, judges, even official receivers are all joined at the hip through bonding and allegiance to the Queen. Not to us at all. But you see, there is a problem with the status quo. Our country has a fine heritage and history. From this has been born a constitution with many facets. A commonality of the highest echelons has been that binding through allegiance and duty to the Queen. Fine, I'm a true blue royalist. But in practice, it means that those humans are brought together in an impenetrable club which works for the good of its members, not us UK citizens. That situation also relates to all parliamentarians, members of the Privy Council and many more. This constitutional position was contrived for Her Majesty, long may she reign, to form the broad establishment who can behave as they wish whilst using her name. The effect for ordinary UK citizens is an almost iron ceiling which defies democracy at a very important level. It just so happens that the real adverse situation for most of us has been revealed in the latest run-up for a search to replace the Human Rights Act 1998 by a Bill of Rights, let alone the, the positioning of our obligations to European law. I have made many practical suggestions for change in my previous videos with regard to this. The main one is for the establishment of an independent supra-authority over the judicial system when it comes to our rights. Not one controlled by the judiciary itself or even their involvement, but one which is democratic and answerable to the people. In Europe, there is talk of a constitutional court. That's a good idea. Yet, as I speak, the issue of our membership within the EU is warming up to an election. There is purposeful obfuscation going on with regard to the law, legal status, and obligations. Now, there just happens to be one sphere of influence over which the Queen does not have authority or even status. In fact, you and I have such equal status. That is the UK's control and obligations over our human rights. As with other EU members, these are vested in Europe and where necessary, suborned to the European Court of Justice Luxembourg. That caring arrangement was formed for the benefit of you and me. Yet it was a combination of politicians and the judiciary who combined to form that 1998 Act which cheated and betrayed the highest constitutional law in our land, with the express purpose of passing control and determination of our rights to the judiciary. Yes, those people, more than any other public body, who deny and abuse those rights. But that is too soft a description for the practice and purpose of the judicial system. Simply, you see, the aforesaid highest constitutional law for our rights not only gives us the means but control over a whole range of wrongs which can be perpetrated against us. Yet the practical outcome is injustice, the results of which are all too often delivered in our courts. The what's, why's and how's of this I have detailed elsewhere. But the main features are exercising the abuse of power, often criminal, and committing systemic fraud. The motives of unfettered power and greed hold hands together. 
The result is pandemic fraud and cheating at all levels. Not only have successive governments maintained that no control can be exercised against all this, using impartiality as an excuse, but they have given them so much legitimate and easy means to continue the systemic offences. Not least one of these is the division between the civil and criminal courts, which I have detailed elsewhere. In France, they have a procurator fiscal. In the US, criminality and civil courts are combined. In the UK, we are not even allowed to mention criminality in the civil courts. What a beautiful gift to the judicial system, all of them. From my experience, they can manipulate most outcomes. Of course, there is no independent control upon them. In closing, I move to another category. You see, so much of what goes on in this country is exercised behind closed doors and purposeful secrecy. For instance, there is that wicked memorandum of understanding between the legal system and the police, which allows them to decide in secret who will be prosecuted or, just as importantly, who will not be. You can imagine who they are. Immunity and impunity are on offer. So, the enemy of secrecy is publicity, and that involves freedom of expression. Which is why the special squad in the Queen's Bench Division of the High Court was formed, to crush exposure of wrongdoings, and by gosh, I have evidenced thousands of them. That is why certain many judges in that Queen's Bench Division came together with two crooks, and I have all the proof to form a criminal conspiracy against me. The twin evil took the form of denial of truthful reporting about the judicial system, lawfully and legally reported, alongside an offset for the immunity and impunity to be given to those two crooks. The squad was in league with the socialist MPs Blair, Brown and Jack Straw to coincide with the 1998 Act. Indeed, it was my reporting of Jack Straw's involvement in Libya that was part of the reason for silencing me. It was later found out to be true, of course, but please note that he was Minister of Justice, sitting on the front, front bench of the government, yet claiming the independence of the judiciary. A string of penal, penal orders from a civil court against me were issued to blackmail and torture me for an immunity confession. Oppression through criminal abuse of power had already arrived for me. I resisted, of course, by delivering millions of words of the truth to the courts. It was to no avail. From secret courts and hearings, without my presence, of course, I was arrested. On both occasions, there were no charges brought against me. The police refused to show me their warrant on both occasions, and it was only after four weeks' stay in Dorchester Prison was I given a copy of the warrant, reluctantly handed over by the Governor. I report the above again because today, on completing this script, the last UK prisoner in Guantanamo Bay was released back into this country. He had been locked up without charge, and eventually public awareness and support came to his rescue. You may think that my endurance does not compare to his, but this country has more subtle ways and means. My enemies had a plan B in store for me, should I not comply, simply to get me sectioned to a mental home. Once in there, I would effectively disappear until my end day. No one would be the only the wiser. Luckily, my occasional ex-solicitor thwarted that plan. But I now jump back to the Court of Appeal in between the two prison sentences. I trusted that all my historical submissions and evidence would at last produce resolution and justice. My nightmares could be over, couldn't they? The crookedness and my failure at that court are reported in detail elsewhere by me. But in the process, they raised significance to everyone in the civilised world. I was told, nay, ordered, by the very man now in charge of Ipso, the body for control over free expression for the UK press, the erstwhile Lord Justice Judge Moses, 
that I was not allowed to use the truth as a or the defence in the extended libel action, but rather subject to the court's interpretation. Therefrom, I was told that I must not tell the truth. Further, I was ordered to lie because a judge's order is superior to the truth. It can be eradicated by a decree. And this precedent, a previous decision which can be used or ignored at will, clearly migrated to the European Court of Justice, which has now ruled that the truth reported on the internet can be and must be eradicated upon demand. Not only does that fly in the face of freedom of expression, it is costing many an organisation a fortune in compliance, but is putting a further stranglehold on what should be free research and reporting. Additionally, in the courts, the judiciary has been given unfettered power to remove juries, with a single judge sitting on his or her biased own. Completely unfair financial penalties, and don't forget the use of the civil courts, I repeat, the civil courts, to imprison anyone without trial or even charge. The repression and control of George Orwell's 1984 has surely arrived. It was last week that the Battle of Britain's 75th anniversary was celebrated. Those brave pilots, among many besides, fought selflessly for our protection through belief, faith, honour against an enemy without. Now we have an enemy within. In my travels through these last 26 years, at the beginning I was denied justice through cheating and criminality. The further I strove to get restitution and that justice, I was met with a vicious resistance, which led to the victimization, torture, terrorization, persecution, later to be exercised against my forcibly estranged partner. It has completely ruined her life. Yet there has been a solution to this for many a year the respect for and action over human rights. The basic law on this goes back to the early 1950s and has been expanded. Amazingly, in the UK, Parliament granted the judicial system complete control over those rights and much else to deny and abuse our rights substantially for their own interest. But in addition, the suppression of truth is affecting our freedoms world worldwide. Right now, incredibly, we have Moses in charge of what effectively is direct censorship of the press. And Straw is an active high-flying member of the body seeking to curtail the Freedom of Information facility, well used by the press to great effect. Those liberties of human rights and freedom of expression are essential to civilised countries, constantly proclaimed by the UK establishment across the world. Yet, let it be known here and now, that we have an abysmal and evil record in this country of abuse and denial. In my next video, I will provide more detail. But meanwhile, comprehensive information and evidence can be found in my four autobiographies at present on ebooks, lulu.com. And Google search www.standrewstrusts.org. The time has surely come to change our blind faith and trust in the status quo and to bring about long overdue change, a reform which will give us back our rights and eradicate the widespread corruption which is played out against us. Thank you for watching and hopefully to receive your support on Facebook, Twitter, blog and so on. The 11th hour is nearly upon us and action is required from all of us right now.